if we don't have a good education system, we, we don't have young people learn to fend for themselves in life. And I, I actually think the most important reason to educate young people is cultural. It is, of course, important that they can earn a living and there's more instrumental things about education, but having a sense of who they are is the most important thing to me. And the, I, I think of it as giving them the best of the past so that they can use it as a springboard into the future. Welcome to The Shape of Dialogue. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Michael Johnston. Welcome, Michael. Thanks for joining me on the podcast today. Well, thanks for having me. It's great to have you on. Now, we're going to be talking about education. So, Mm -hmm. but before we do that, who is Michael Johnston? Can you tell us about yourself and what you've done? Well, I'm a cognitive psychologist by training. I I did my PhD at the University of Melbourne uh, in visual perception. So I actually studied the way in which we can recognize objects when they're rotated in three dimensions. Of course, the, the retina, which is the light receptive surface at the back of your eye, is two-dimensional, so you've got two of them. The An image of an object projected onto both, but of course, when it rotates in three dimensions, the shape of that image on the back of your retina changes quite a lot. <clears throat> so somehow the brain reinstates three dimensions and is able to recover which object it is, even though the, uh, the the projection on the retina changes quite markedly as the object rotates. So that was what my PhD was about. Um, then I went back to the area in which I did my honours work, which was psycholinguistics, so studying the brain mechanisms of recognising words visually. So this connects to reading, and I did some work on dyslexia as well. That is, you know, uh, people who have difficulty learning to read uh, and what the the basis of that is. Uh, Then in in the early 2000s, I came back to New Zealand from Australia and uh, I I taught for a little while at uh, Victoria University on a foundation studies program. I was teaching mathematics at at that stage. After that, I did six and a half years at NZQA during a very interesting period. This was early in the NCEA experience. Just, and sorry, just to articulate what in, um, yeah. NZQA is. Well, NZQA is the New Zealand Qualifications Authority. So they run all the exams and assessment system for schools as well as administering other qualifications. <clears throat> and when I arrived, actually about a week after I arrived, there was a huge crisis because it was the second full year of NCEA, which is our senior qualification for secondary students in New Zealand and uh, all kinds of variability in the data from the previous year and uh, this was because they hadn't put in place technical measures to control variability and it caused a political crisis and in fact the chief executive had to resign and the uh, board mostly resigned and then State Services Commission wrote two very critical reports. The uh, senior management was cleaned out. The organization was restructured. And then Bali Haak, who is a principal, has been a principal of many schools in New Zealand, came in as the deputy chief executive. At, and I actually ended up working very closely with him over the next few years to help fix the technical problems with NCEA. I think other problems still remain, but we fixed most of the technical problems. And then after that, I moved to Victoria University. And this is when I got into the academic side of education. I worked in the education faculty there for 10 years. Uh, and after that, I came to the New Zealand Initiative, which is where I am now. And that was just about a, a year ago. I started here a little bit more. Right. What is the New Zealand Initiative? So the New Zealand Initiative is a think tank uh, based in Wellington, and we do work across a wide range of policy areas, and my area is, of course, education. Right. Why, why do you care about education? Oh, gee. Well, it's critical to the future. Uh, if we don't have a good education system, we, we don't have young people learn to fend for themselves in life. And I, I actually think the most important reason to educate young people is cultural. It is, of course, important that they can earn a living and there's more instrumental uh, things about education, but actually having a sense of who they are is the first most important thing to me. And that that means, I I, I think of it as giving them 
the best of the past so that they can use it as a springboard into the future. So I, I guess I'm what you call a curriculum conservative. I, I, I think that the, the curriculum for schools should reflect uh, the knowledge of the past, not because we want to hold people in the past, but because that's the best basis to go forward. Right. Interesting. So, yes, that's, uh, that's very interesting what you're saying about you think the, the, the main focus of education should be cultural. That's not what I would, would have expected. Well, it's, it, it's the, the word cultural needs to be interpreted broadly. So I'm talking about all of the disciplines of, of our culture. So mathematics is, is a, a discipline that's, well, at least two and a half thousand years old, depending on how you, uh, how you define mathematics. But uh, if you go back to the, the ancient Greeks, they, they developed mathematics a long way. And of course, it kept developing from, from there, including with contributions from the Arabs, from India and elsewhere. This becomes a very important platform of understanding uh, science, you know, arguably a bit younger than mathematics, but still a very old discipline. And then history, which tells us the stories of our past uh, with evidence and, and a critical analysis. Uh, all of these disciplines, I think, are important. And the aesthetic disciplines, the arts as well, uh, literature, art, music, these are all important things for young people to be exposed to. And they'll make choices and selections as they go along, but to give them a basis and an idea of what's out there to know is very important. Of course, school is only the beginning of the learning journey. So whether we go and go to university or go into a trade or start a business or whatever it might be, having that basis of knowledge helps to bring us together as, as people uh, to have a, some kind of common basis in knowledge and, and also uh, gives us opportunities and paths to follow. So one of the good spin-offs of that is that people can be employed and earn a living this is important, but we don't want to focus too narrowly on that, in my view, when it comes to thinking, of, especially about education at school level. Yeah. So, uh, okay. Yeah, so, when you say cultural, you, you're really talking about everything. Then, if you if you're talking about math, science, and I'm arts. talking about the I'm talking about the human experience and what we've invented. And yeah. The kinds of thought systems we've invented, the kinds of modes of self expression we've invented, these are part of our culture. Yeah. Uh, and. And of course, in New Zealand, you know, we're, we're a bicultural nation. I, I think that, that we do need to have a place for Māori thinking and knowledge as well. Uh, I don't think it should be mashed into the, the more Western traditions. I don't think they're a very good fit, but uh, that doesn't mean that I don't think it has an important place. Yeah. Well, I would posit that we're a multicultural nation. Uh, well, yeah. that's a fair point. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Okay. So that, that's very interesting. So you're really saying that the more knowledge we have and the broader that knowledge is, um, that's better for the individual and for the society. Yeah, and the kind of knowledge we have is important too. Yeah. So I don't think any knowledge is as good as any other knowledge. And that, that's one of the problems with our NCEA assessment system, actually. It, uh, kids can get credits from just about anything. Uh, including mowing the lawn or uh, cleaning the house, potentially, uh, and I would not wouldn't want to put that on the same platform as science or history or English. Uh, so, I think the, the disciplines, the, the the structures of uh, thinking and self expression that have developed over centuries are the, the are the core, or should be the core, as a place for vocational education, even at school level, but. I think everybody should have good exposure to the disciplines. Yeah. Well, here's a simple question. What is education? Um, <clears throat> there are different ways of attacking that question. From a, the perspective of human learning and the, the, the brain, I would say, and this is quite a technical answer, uh, education is the transfer of knowledge from uh short-term memory to long-term memory that's learning anyway that's that's how i define long you know learning that is going to take us somewhere but in a social sense i'd say education is the transmission of knowledge intergenerationally 
so that each generation can build on the knowledge of the of the last. And you know, I think I think often of Isaac Newton's uh, saying that he stands on the shoulders of giants. I think we all do, and um, he was a giant himself. Maybe you know we're not all Isaac Newton, but we can all stand on the shoulders of people like him in order to see further. Yes, yeah, we I, I completely agree with that, and in the sense we're we're the luckiest ones who've ever, ever been alive at the moment. At the moment, we're certainly the beneficiaries of the greatest legacy of knowledge in human history, and the the rate at which knowledge accumulates is is unprecedented as well. Yeah. So, and we can think of that as lucky, and in some sense, it is. We're we're the most prosperous. Uh, human beings in the history of the planet and that prosperity is rapidly spreading everywhere this is something to be immensely grateful for we, we've got you know uh, just in my lifetime an immense reduction in the number of people around the world who live in absolute poverty this is a brilliant thing uh, we have some of the most open societies we've ever had although I worry that that's under threat that's it, something we might talk about and how education can actually help with that potentially uh, I guess the pace of change is something that is more of a challenge for us. So if we went back 300 years or further, life wouldn't change much within a single lifetime. So because the pace at which knowledge was accumulating and technology was being developed was much slower, you know, li life was, would have been much the same for us as for our grandparents. Now, of course, that that is not true. I think of my grandparents who, who lived to see two world wars, a Great Depression, the development, right through to the development of the internet. You know, that's massive change in one lifetime. And we, we can see that change accelerating even more now. We're, we're on the brink of, you know, ge generative artificial intelligence becoming a big part of our economies and social fabric even. Uh, We've already had it massively disrupted by the internet revolution, by social media, these things. And, and so while I agree with you that we're immensely, immensely fortunate to be alive as we are now, we can look forward to longer lives and uh, more prosperous lives than in the past. There are some challenges that come with the pace of change. Yeah. Well, life, life has become more complex. Um, you know, so, so within every benefit, there's always a cost generally. Uh, yeah, or at least, uh, you know, risks and challenges that we have to negotiate. Yeah. And and getting back to education. So that's why education is so important, because the more, the more you are educated, the more capable you are of na navigating. And it goes back to what I was saying about, you know, rooting ourselves in the past. That, that to me, is the firmest foundation for dealing with whatever comes our way. Yeah, so getting back to that, you're, you're really talking about education as passing on traditions from generation to generation. More than traditions. I mean, traditions can be part of it. I think cultural traditions are important. Um, of course, they can morph and change over time and, and they, should, they do and should evolve. But I'm talking more about knowledge and ways of thinking critically. And so, I mean, critical thinking doesn't necessarily come naturally to human beings. It's actually quite counter-instinctual. We've, we've got built into us all kinds of biases to our thinking. We like to, we like to be correct. So... We tend to seek uh, evidence for things that we already believe. We we uh, we like to fit in, so we we tend to bias ourselves to agree with the people around us. Th this kind of thing. Th these things are not good for science. They're not good for advancing our understanding. And so, I think the disciplines of things like science and mathematics and history they help us countervail those biases yeah and and actually democracy depends on people being a bit independent minded and and being able to think through things through yeah and and being rational well to to a degree at least yeah i mean arguably one can be too rational you know you can think of mr spock from star trek who had no emotions and was ruthlessly logical at all times human beings aren't like that i, I think the the emotional side of things matters too but we should definitely cultivate rationality yeah yeah i, I always think the M mr spock argument is a bit of a red herring personally because 
none of us are Mr. Spock. No, that's right. But I don't, I don't think we should kind of worship rationality either. I think it's yeah. an important tool, but uh, we we mustn't necessarily allow it to, to rule in an unbridled way. Yeah, well, it's like most things. It's, it's, it's a balance between... Um, you know, two opposing forces. Indeed, but but I agree with you. I think it it, it needs to be cultivated through education. The, the ability to be rational and the ability to see when we're not being rational. These things are important. Yeah. Well, that's actually when it, when I said it's um, you know passing on tradition from generation to, to generation. I what that's actually partly what I meant about how we how we think, and you know those, yeah. those essentially those philosophical bedrocks to thinking. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's reasonable to think of the disciplines as being part of a tradition, but I'd say they're more than that. They're knowledge structures. They're ways, of, and they're ways of testing knowledge. So testing truth claims. Science is, you know, a brilliant tool for that, and we take it for granted a bit, but, you know, we, we've really got to remember that it wasn't until Karl Popper in the mid-20th century, a philosopher of science, a great philosopher of science, articulated the principle of falsifiability. That is the idea that something is only a scientific theory if we can conceive of experimental outcomes that would prove it wrong, that science really came of age. So we can think we can trace it back to Aristotle and, you know, all kinds of traditions of thought from many different countries and cultures through two and a half millennia. But really, it was Popper who fully articulated what science is to me. And, you know, in some ways he was formulating what scientists had already been doing for a while. But we mustn't take it for granted. It is a, a counterintuitive way of thinking, and that's why it needs to be inculcated through education. It, it doesn't occur naturally. Yeah, yeah. Well, you've written a report. Um, what tell us? Tell us what that report is called and why you've written it, and then we can yeah, rip so, into it. And uh... so, the, the, this is the the latest report out of the New Zealand Initiative. It, it's called Save Our Schools, which sounds <laughs> perhaps melodramatic, but I, I think uh, our schools do need saving. Our, our school system needs saving. We're, we've got a raft of problems, probably. To me, the three most important ones, uh, I'll go in ascending order. I think NCEA, the, the senior school qualification, needs attention. Uh, there, there are multiple problems there. Most of the problems stem from the fact that at each su in each subject at each year level, there are multiple assessments that all contribute credits. And some of them are assessed during the year. Those are called internal assessment and those assessments are marked by students' own teachers, and the results are reported to NZQA, the Qualifications Authority. And then at the end of the year, there's an, a round of exams, and even in one subject, you might have three exams, each each contributing its own credits. So the results of this, first of all, the impact on learning and teaching is that Teachers will tend to approach each standard, which is each assessment, as if it's a topic to be taught. And maybe you say there's nothing wrong with that, but the standards are not designed to be curriculum units, they're designed to be assessment units. Uh, and what that approach tends to do is to cut things up into bits. And because there's no incentive in the assessment system to make connections across and between standards, those connections are often not made, so learning becomes a bit disconnected. But it gets worse than that because uh, because students are accumulating credits during the year, they will set targets for themselves. And sometimes they'll think, I've met my target for this subject, I won't bother with any more in this subject now, I'm going to focus on other things. And tactically, that makes sense within the NCA system. But of course, it leaves gaps in students' knowledge, which makes it difficult for them to go on and in a subject where they've decided they've got enough credits. Uh, and then they have a, an incomplete understanding of the subject. 
Uh, the other thing it does is the internal assessment system in particular fosters a credit accumulation mentality in students. So they, they will focus on passing the assessments so very often at the expense of, of deeper learning of, of what they're, they're, they're uh, presented with in class. And teachers can be seduced by that as well. They're the ones who are making the assessment decisions for internal assessment. So they're both teacher and assessor. And this can lead to a situation where they'll, and they're on, you know, they're gunning for their students. They want their students to do well. And so they can sometimes gloss things a bit. Uh, and every incentive is in place for them to do that. So really, I do think about the assessment system in terms of what it incentivizes. And I don't think that NCEA as it is incentivizes deep learning and complete learning Matt. so my prescription for that is to reduce each reduce the, the number of assessments in each subject at each year level to two one internally assessed one externally assessed uh, not to report any results during the year so that students are not accumulating credits along the way to take the focus off that teachers still should use the internal assessment formatively that means they should use it to help students progress they can collect information about how students are doing and then you know feed back to them feedback is an incredibly important part of teaching and i would like to see the internal assessment one that is contributed to, to throughout the year and then perhaps produces a, a little portfolio of evidence about what the student has learned during the year and then have that submitted to NZ nzqa to be marked not to have the teachers mark it themselves so I don't think there's any advantage to a te to learning for a teacher to award a grade. Again, to use the assessment formatively, yes, but not not to award a grade. In fact, grades, you know, there's research that shows that as soon as a a student gets a grade, they close their ears to feedback. So it's actually yeah. poisonous to learning to be given grades, and it sets up the wrong motivations. So I think grades at any level are uh, put learning at risk. Uh, a student who gets poor grades, they have their their self image or their self efficacy as a learner it, it put it put at risk. Uh, and students who constantly get high grades can get addicted to getting high grades. I mean, literally, you get a dopamine yeah. hit. You know, the same as getting a, a like on Twitter. Well, what, or and a, what's wrong with that? Uh, it puts the motivation in the wrong place. You're chasing the grade instead of the learning. Right. So I want to de-emphasize grades. They, they they have to exist because we have to credential people, and and so I'm not saying there should be no grades ever. Why, why do we Why just, do we have to credential people? Uh, well, how 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 do you think otherwise we would be happy that somebody was a competent doctor or lawyer or engineer? Yeah, but or, we're not we're not talking about kids being at that stage being doctors and lawyers. No, we're not. I, I'm not uh, saying we shouldn't. We shouldn't, you know, ha have credential so for doctors. By and large, school credentialing is is more about readiness for further study. So we have university entrance, for example. Uh, we might argue that standard isn't high enough. When when I was at the university, I certainly saw lots of students coming through with insufficient writing skills to really cope at university. So we can argue about the level of the standard, but. If, if people are going to university, we want to know that they've got a, a serious chance of, of doing well there. And so um, essentially, it's a pa it's a passport a for for future development. Yeah. yeah, I would say so. And and if they're going to a polytech, you know, you, you still want to make sure that they've got sufficient skill and knowledge to to do well. Now, New New Zealand used to be ranked third in the world behind uh, Singapore and Finland. You're talking about the PISA study? Yeah. 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 Um, when was that and where are we now? Well, the, so PISA's been around a little more than 20 just, years. Uh, and the first, just, sorry, explain what PISA is first. So PISA is, is a, it's an assessment system run by the OECD. And at the start, it was just OECD countries that took part in it. But now it's much broader. There's, there's many countries, probably, you know, 50 or upwards of 50 countries 
who take part in PISA. And, and, it, and it's, it's assessing the, the education system itself as a whole. It's assessing, so the way it works is a, a, a sample of 15-year-olds uh, set tests in reading, in science, and in numeracy. And we monitor over time how countries are performing. And there are rankings where countries, you you alluded to New Zealand starting off in, in the early piece of rounds at, at number three in the, in the rank order. Uh, but really the important thing is how we do relative to ourselves over time. I'm less concerned about us where we sit relative to other countries than I am about the fact that we have declined on all three measures consistently over that over that twenty odd year period. And and what what's the rate of decline? Is that shallow or steep? Uh, I wouldn't say that it's precipitous, but it's 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 what I call slow and gradual slow and but steady. We're we're significantly poorer than we were. Right. So, a, a percent, could you give us a percentage from twenty years ago? If twenty, if, 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 well, if, well, it's hard to. It, it's not a percentage scale. No, but just sort of uh, an, some indication. You know, if, if uh, I mean, I'd have to ask you what a percentage of what. Well, if, what if, you mean? if, if twenty years ago we were a hundred, where are we now? Have we dropped fifty percent? A hundred. If, if, if you're talking about percentages, you have to say a percentage of what. Well, okay. Otherwise, the word percentage doesn't make okay. sense. <laughs> Um, um, I suppose I'm trying to get a feel for how far we have fallen. Have we? Is it, is it just marginal or is it substantial? I, I think it's significant, and we can look to other data to to confirm that. So, for example, uh, last year the Ministry of Education trialled new assessments for 15 year olds in reading, writing, and numeracy. And these assessments are supposed to be co-requisites for any level of NCEA, meaning that students wouldn't be able to get any level of NCEA without passing all three of these assessments. And in one trial, we saw only a third of our students exhibit a basic adult level of writing. A third? A third. It was much worse than that at, at, at... Low decile schools, so decile one school, these are the poorest communities in the country. Only one in 50 passed the writing assessment. One in 50. So two, that's 2%. 2%. Two percent. Two percent. So it's, it's, it's essentially zero then. I mean, it's yes. good as zero. Yeah, hardly anyone at, low, at those very low wow. decile schools. Reading uh, was somewhat better, two thirds passed that assessment, but that's still not great when you consider that we're only talking about a level of reading that is estimated to prepare people for functioning in society, for, for basic employment, for getting by. It's not you know the kind yeah. of reading you'd need at university. It's essentially it, being able to read a newspaper, isn't it? Is that correct? That kind yeah. of thing. Correct. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and then numeracy was somewhere in between. It was just over half. And that that's really serious it, too. So, because, so is, that, is that for the decile... One or four overall? No, no, that's just for everybody. For everyone. And so... I can't remember the DSL one figure for numeracy, but it, it was it was pretty poor. It, the order of 20-something percent. Yeah. I mean, to me, that is mind-blowingly bad, hearing those statistics. Yeah, I think and, it's, it's and, extremely serious. It's, and it's, so, it's incredibly tragic because you're actually consigning people to... Yeah, to to very limited options of what they can do, especially now. Agreed, and, and 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 I think it's you know one thing that I, I say about this, to, just to give people a wake up call, our prisons are full of illiterate young men. Yeah, what does that tell you? Yeah, well, yeah. It, it it's it's certainly puts people at risk in many ways, not not getting those basic skills. And I guess this brings us back to the report. So I've talked about the NCA system and that. That's one of my big three, but it's it's the least of the big three. Yeah. <laughs> the, the other two I, I almost put on a par, but I, I'll say the the second ranking issue is curriculum. So that is the document that sets out what schools need to inculcate in young people, what teachers need to teach yeah. them. Uh, and at the moment, the New Zealand curriculum is what I would call threadbare. Uh so if we if we think about just those basic skills of literacy and numeracy, 
you don't see much guidance there for teachers at all. There's very little to tell them what a student should be able to do at what age. And that, that, that's a serious problem because if we don't have a, a way of putting some lines in the sand, some flags for the teachers to know when students are falling behind, they fall through the cracks. Just, and sorry, when sorry just to push business, back on that. Yeah. Isn't it sort of obvious, isn't it? I mean, I, I've, I've spent 40 years of my life as a teacher. Um, mm. I was a, a private music teacher, so not, not a school teacher, but I know a lot about teaching. And, um, and uh, isn't it obvious to a teacher if someone is, you know, if they can't, if, if they're getting 50% of, of the equations wrong in mathematics, isn't that clear? I think there's a, when you've got somebody who's really falling behind, it's probably obvious. But there, there are kids on the margin who may go unnoticed, especially if they're quiet in class, especially if they're in what's called a modern learning environment with 120 other kids, and maybe there's four teachers, and you know, the quiet ones or the the ones who are just kind of getting on with it, but maybe struggling, they may go unnoticed. Right. Uh, also, there's a cohort effect. If our general level of literacy or numeracy is falling, then actually we need to lift everybody. Yeah. And so somebody who's doing averagely in our current environment is not doing very well. Yeah. Right? Uh, yeah. So we we need to think about those things. And that's why the curriculum needs to set out in much more detail what is actually expected to put people on track so that we don't have right. You know, only 33% of our, our young people able to write at a basic adult level by the time they're 15. Yeah. And of course, if they're unable to read and write, and to a lesser extent, but still important, do basic numeracy when they start secondary school, the whole curriculum becomes inaccessible. Yeah. We need reading to be able to invest ourselves with knowledge at that point. We need writing to help us learn to think, because writing is a tool of thinking. And numeracy is important for a range of disciplines, mathematics, obviously, science, economics. These all require a degree of numeracy. So we really close off options. The, the curriculum needs to set out, especially at primary level, those basic skills and milestones so that we, so that teachers are aware. We need to be assessing regularly, not over-assessing, not being obsessed with assessment, but enough information for teachers to know when kids are on track and when they're not. Yeah, assess assessment and, is just feedback. And and in any uh, yeah, and in any right. system, you require uh, you you have to have feedback. Otherwise, you're deaf. Correct. Yeah. That's right. Can, can I just and think yeah. about it in a really basic level? Every organism it, has perceptual systems. Yeah. This goes back to my PhD yeah. work in a way. And those perceptual systems gather information Good. about the state of the environment, and you know, brains compare what is with a, a, a kind of goal state, and then we take action to to correct our state so that we can improve things for ourselves. We can get food and do those basic things. And, you know, for human beings, it, it goes far beyond that. Yeah. We need to know things. We need to have relationships, et cetera. So feedback is a basic biological mechanism uh, and sophisticated feedback is an important mechanism in education. Yeah. Otherwise, you're flying blind. Correct. Yeah. That's right. And too many of our teachers now are flying blind in all sorts of ways. Right. One thing that's occurred to me when I was reading your report was, isn't it quite simple? We find who is the best performing, what, what, what the best performing country is, and just copy their system. I don't think it is that simple. Uh, and that's because co there are cultural differences between different uh, countries and Actually, let me just finish off on the curriculum yep. thing yep. because the, the, what you just said connects to the most important thing as far as I'm concerned. So uh, as well as literacy and numeracy, we, we need to specify mu in much more detail the disciplines of science, mathematics, and so on, especially at secondary level. So the curriculum is threadbare, and it also puts up front what it calls key competencies. These are things like managing yourself and relating to others, social skills, oral language, now, those things are all important, but they're also what I'd call biologically primary functions. So it's not the job of teachers to directly teach those things. And it's ineffective to try to directly teach those things. You can't teach somebody how 
you know, by instructing them how to make a friend, you might give them some advice or something like that. But really, the, the most important thing is the environment in that regard. So you want school environments to be rich in oral language. You want them to be socially harmonious. You want them to be orderly. And then those biologically primary things will fall into place uh, qu quite naturally because we have built into our brains mechanisms to encode social schema and, and to learn oral language and so on. What we want our teachers to focus on is the secondary knowledge that, that children won't acquire by themselves. So um, that is literacy, numeracy, the disciplines and so on. So, yeah, you know, that, that, and then that brings me to the most important thing and to, and to come back to your question, I think one of the big things that makes a difference between, you know, places like Finland and Singapore that have very strong education systems and consistently do well in, in PISA and other international studies uh, is the cultural esteem for teachers. Right. So, that, that's, 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 that's that a really is, big one. Yeah, that is very true. It's very, um, there is a, a difference, isn't there, in, in how teachers are regarded. Yeah. yeah, and that's an important thing. And it's not easy to sort of repair a problem with the, the respect for the teacher profession. It's, you can't just push a legislative button and fix that, right? Uh, it's a cultural issue. Um, so, and, sorry, are you saying we don't have respect for teachers? In, I don't think, in New Zealand. I don't think that in New Zealand we hold the teaching profession in particularly high esteem. No. Yeah. I mean, there's that joke that, you know, you, you become a teacher because you can't do anything else. That kind of yeah. thing. So that, and that's, you know, that's no good. Why, why would we want to see teachers like that? And it, and it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy in some yeah. ways. And that must relate to um, how much teachers get paid. It has something to do with how much they get paid. It's, it's, it's not the only thing. Mm. You know, and, and there are many good people that go into teaching and they're, they're not highly motivated by money. They're, they're yeah. motivated by making a difference in young people's lives. And I talk to a lot of teachers and that comes across just about always. I think where we're, where we're letting our teachers down is by not training them properly. I think our, our teacher training needs a massive overhaul. And that, over time, could help to improve the cultural esteem for teachers. It's not something that can happen overnight, but we need to set the ship in the right direction so that, over time, we do improve that. I think money is part of it, but I don't want to just pay all teachers more money. Uh, that isn't necessarily going to help. At the moment, we have a model of teacher remuneration that is basically... the based on the amount of time they've been a teacher. So each year you get a bit of an increment and there's no promotion system that takes into account how good a teacher you are. Yes. And so that, you've got, that, you've got that, a misalignment of incentives. Correct. So, so it's, it's basically teachers, if you can sit on your ass for 50 or 40 years, you're going to be paid more. And it's, it, as, as yeah, opposed, yeah. As, so you could actually be a really bad teacher after 40 years and then a new teacher after teaching five years could be the world's greatest teacher, but their the pay is not reflected. Yeah, that's that, right. right. So I mean, there are, there are young people who go into teaching in their twenties who are outstanding, and I would like to see them, you know, shoot to the top of some yeah. scale, where by the time they're thirty, they're 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 being paid really well, yeah. and and it's a huge incentive for them to stay in teaching, to stay in the classroom. But we just don't have that. So one of the proposals in the report is to create a four-tier structure for teachers uh, in their careers so that when they get to a point where they want to move up a tier, they need to submit an application with evidence about why they're a good teacher and why they deserve to be promoted. And I don't want it all based on test scores. I mean, the test scores should play, play a part, but they should not be the whole story. It's a flawed measure of teaching quality it's not it's not nothing but it's not everything either so yeah, you're, you're wanting a holistic um, that, assessment yeah. of of someone's, yeah, that's someone's right. abilities so, you know are they contributing well to the community in their school mm. the, do they look after the young people in their care do they teach them things yes that is a very important yeah component. yeah but it should is it i don't want test scores to be the whole the whole game yeah but i do want to have incentives the good 
young teachers to get ahead, to feel like they're getting ahead, to stay in the profession, because too many of them are burning out and leaving the profession. Right. Uh, and then I want to have incentives for people that are not cut out for it to move on as well and find something else to do. Yeah. So yeah. teaching is a difficult job to do, to be to be a good teacher is an extremely difficult job. You have to master all kinds of different things from relationships to knowledge to how you impart knowledge to how you motivate people. It's a massively complex job and we need to reward the best far better than we are. Yeah. But we also need to have a sorting mechanism so that people who are not really great at it can be go and find something else to be great at. So uh, are we encouraging mediocrity? Through that system, well, I think that the the the, the, the way we remunerate yeah. teachers encourages me- mediocrity and doesn't reward excellence. Uh, so, but we also need to set up teachers to succeed in the first place. At the at the moment, our teacher training is dominated by the universities, so we have a very academic model of teacher training. And you know, I, I think that teaching should be research informed, but I don't really buy the argument. And this comes from somebody who's worked in an education faculty for 10 years. You know, I don't really buy the argument that it takes academics to train teachers. I think what it takes is people who uh, understand the process of learning and can impart that to new teachers. Wouldn't it be we want teachers to teach teachers? Yes. Well, well they should certainly be deeply involved in the in the training of teachers that's right uh, we do have a model that's that does involve teachers and the teaching of teachers if you will uh, I mean a lot of people who work in the faculties of education are themselves ex-teachers and then also teachers and training go into schools and they work with associate teachers in those schools who are supposed to mentor them and coach them and give them feedback and so on but there are, there are problems with the model. So first of all, associate teachers are not necessarily themselves trained in the best approach to, to teaching and learning. And so they can, uh, in, in the words of Kevin Knight, and I'll tell you who he is in a minute, uh, they can uh, perpetuate and amplify the problems uh, rather than improving things. Uh, and at the on the university side, you know, we have to go back a little bit. Uh, 20 years ago, the teachers' colleges, which were specialist teacher training organizations, were merged with the universities. And they tend to be merged in, they tended to be merged into uh, existing schools of education that were heavily sociological in nature. And just sorry, sorry just point, to explain what you mean by sociological. Well, they were, they were full of sociologists. But what is, what, what is just really briefly, so like a lot of people wouldn't know what that is. I'm not a sociologist. I'm a psychologist. Yeah. But sociologists study society and human interaction and the, the structure of human societies, especially power relationships and things right, like that. Okay. I'd argue that uh, sociology is, has been, like mu- much of the humanities, are overrun with an overly relativist view of the world and, and also a, a kind of... Uh, almost neo-Marxist view of the world where identity uh, and power relationships are seen to govern everything. And and I think this has infected education because they absorb the teachers' colleges and then the incoming staff had to do PhDs and largely they were supervised by sociologists when they did. And so now we have a generation of uh, teacher trainers who are deeply... In, uh, steeped in the socio-cultural view of the world and we see it in the way schools operate right. and we see it in the materials produced by the Ministry of Education for schools and the, what what's lacking is the psychological side, how people actually learn. There's very little of that in our teacher training. So th- this is... I you mean, know, not, I, I, not I'm a, laughing, but that's, it's, that's, tr- that's a tragic statement. Yeah. Now, I mentioned Kevin Knight and I'll tell you who he is. He... He's the head of one of very few independent uh, teacher education providers in the country, the Graduate School of Education, the New Zealand Graduate School of Education, and they're located in Christchurch. They're a pretty small outfit, but I'd like to see them much bigger, and I'd like to see more operators like them. 
they have quite a different model. And I, I think they provide a really good model of how teacher education could work. So they do have uh, teacher educators who are themselves ex-teachers. That, that there's no doubt that they see that as important, but they're not steeped in sociology necessarily. They certainly have a sociological side because it is important for us to understand that education systems are part of social structures. And um, But they also uh, do a lot of work on the psychological side, how, how children actually learn. So they they learn about structured literacy. This is a very effective method of teaching kids to read and write, uh, informed by science, especially my discipline of cognitive psychology. So they learn that side of it too. But the critical thing is they spend the bulk of their time actually practicing teaching in classrooms and the school that hosts them, their only job yeah. is to provide opportunities to teach. Yeah, well, the, the, so start yeah. from the graduate school, come and do the coaching and the mentoring. So there's consistency with the between the what they're doing in their coursework and what what then the feedback they're getting in class and critically the assessment for this program is a long list of skills that good teachers have and they have to demonstrate consistently and fluently over time in order to be to in order to graduate so it's to me this is the kind of model that I'd like to see promoted yeah well uh, yeah I was going to mention that is you know we we learn best by by doing rather than sitting at a desk writing, you know. Certainly uh, when it comes to skills, we yes. do. There are, so, there are some other things that I think we learn quite well by sitting at a desk and writing. Critical thinking, yeah, for example. I, I, yeah, so, I, I agree. So the process of writing, I actually think, is a, a massively important one for any kind of higher order thinking uh, because cognitively, we can't hold that much in our heads at once. We can outsource our thoughts in, to, in writing then and sort of move it around. I mean, I love you know <clears throat> one thing that I love about the computer age is, is yeah. being able to type. So even though I'm a terrible typist, but I I can get my thoughts out into a page and move them around and edit them and think about them and really hone them. It's much more difficult to do if you're writing with a pen, especially if your handwriting is as poor as mine. Well, all I can say is ditto. Yeah, it's a it's a much. I couldn't survive without a computer, basically. Um, um, one thing I'd like to touch on is is uh, uh, what a number of teachers have told me is the degree of the increase of bureaucracy in the yep. teaching system. Um, yep. uh, just is this is completely anecdotal. So take it for what it is. But um, a, a teacher, she was you know she would have been in sixties, so she spent her whole life teaching. She said back in the day, you know, teaching five year olds, six year olds, that sort of thing. If you wanted to go out and have a look at, you know, some oak trees and pick up some leaves and go and discover the world, you know, outside of the school um, grounds, you just pick up sticks and do it. Now yep. you have to do a risk assessment award, uh, um, risk assessment assessment or whatever the term is, um, and you have to go through a whole plethora of bureaucratic steps. Um, I think another teacher told me that the the paperwork had doubled or tripled i can't remember this was a long time ago but it wasn't a marginal increase and no. so it's sort of like um it's making it harder and harder for teachers to actually teach they're they're spending a lot of time ticking boxes and complying yeah it's terrible for young people as well because they're less likely to go on that trip out oh, oh to, yeah the it's sure. it's sure. the, if the teacher has to jump through all kinds of hoops to make yeah, it well, happen. Basically, just things, things, dynamic things like that just don't happen. And yeah. learning, again, you know, I mean, I've, I've been a teacher. Learning has to be very dynamic. You know, you have to, yeah, you have to right. take left and right turns every, you know, w when, when the opportunity comes up. It's not a, it's not a prescriptive um, no. uh, process. I mean, you're, you're touching there on a wider issue for social issue, I think, which is a kind of culture of safety mm. where we, we're we becoming incredibly risk averse as a society. Yeah. And of course, you know, you want to look after young people and make sure they don't fall off cliffs and crash their bikes into trucks or whatever. But um, Well, it's, it's got the, the irony is as, as society becomes safer and safer and safer, we're more yes. risk averse. Yeah, I know. That's right. And, it, you know, you, you're probably aware of uh, Greg Lukianoff and Jonathan Haidt's book, The Coddling of the American Mind. So the, um, 
there are American academics who published this book on really why it is we're in, in, in such uh, difficulties with polarization in our society and, and why we've got this, this cancel culture phenomenon where people can't stand ideas that they disagree with. And one of the, the roots of it, they say, is social media. Uh, but the other, they say, is uh, overly risk-averse parenting and, and um, not letting kids explore the world in a way that will result in some bumps and bruises, and both both physically and psychologically. Uh, and but if they don't have those bumps and bruises, then they don't become resilient because yeah. human beings are what they call well. Actually, Nicholas Taleb ta- coined this term anti-fragile. Yeah. And anti-fragile systems are ones that get stronger under a bit of stress and strain and and human beings are like that it's psychologically uh yeah especially so we need to be challenged we need to face failure we need to face difficulty and and risk and if we don't we we grow up fragile and then we get this phenomenon of people not being able to even see ideas that they disagree with as safe to encounter and they want trigger warnings, and they want safe spaces, and they want people cancelled if they say things that they disagree with, and so on. Well, it, not good for democracy, not good for individual people. Yeah, yeah. I mean, just on that, essentially, they never grow up. Um, they remain right. children. But also, just uh, going back to safetyism, again, just an anecdotal um, comment. The school that my kids went to, I'm pretty sure this is correct, they know the kids are no longer allowed to climb trees. Yeah, and as someone who spent their whole life in trees as a young boy, um, I find yeah. that unbelievably shocking. And you know, fell out of quite a lot of trees and broke arms and things like that. Um, I find that uh, pretty mind blowing. Yes, my, I've got a nine year old daughter, and and she likes climbing trees as well. And um, they haven't quite got to the point where they're not allowed to climb trees at all. But her favourite tree has been banned at school. Um, the banning trees now. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, again, we laugh, but it, it is actually tragic. Yes. Yeah. Well, in her case, I can make sure that she gets plenty of opportunity yeah. to, to climb things. And, and But the, the effect on the overall culture of this, this degree of risk aversion is really quite tragic. Yeah. Now, there's... Especially with ideas, you know. I mean, physically, yeah, people have got to learn to take risks as well. And, and I, I disagree with banning tree climbing and all of that but the most important thing is that they encounter ideas quite young that they find challenging and that they learn that other people have different opinions and that that's not wrong and that they might have something to learn from them and this kind of so yeah yeah i I completely agree now the current labor government has done a what's called a, a refresh of the curriculum do you want to talk about that and also talk about the instantiation of traditional Maori knowledge? Now, just yep. for overseas listeners, Maori are the were the first people to arrive in New Zealand, um, sort of eight hundred years ago ish, um, and that traditional Maori knowledge, the term for that is Mataranga Maori, and how that has been you know, instilled into the curriculum. Yeah. So the curriculum refresh, when it was announced, I was quite hopeful because there was an idea that things were going to be beefed up a bit in terms of the content of the curriculum. As I said before, I think that the current curriculum is threadbare. It hasn't got nearly enough specification and structure in it for teachers. And I have to say, when I look at the refreshed curriculum documents, the draft documents, They have improved things a bit in that regard. Not enough. There's there's still not enough meat there. But as you've alluded, they've also made it worse in some ways by trying to fuse Mataranga Māori, Māori traditional knowledge, into disciplines like science, mathematics. Now, there's a kind of hot debate about this, and it hasn't been a debate that's especially well conducted because it's too marred by accusations of racism and and things like that and really we need to be able to talk about these things much more openly but if we think about Mataranga Māori and science 
where I would start is to observe that all cultures, Māori culture and Western culture and other cultures, do grapple with knowing about the natural world. We have to. But I think that the debate has been marred by insufficient understanding of what science actually is. So science, as I alluded to before, is a rigorous testing of truth claims by attempting to prove them wrong. And, and it's a, a very counterintuitive thing to do. Human beings usually want to prove themselves right. So it's a, that's why it's appropriately called a discipline, because it disciplines our thinking. It disciplines the way in which we construct our ideas about the world. Now, in order to get to where we have with science, we've needed to go through quite a lot of cultural shifts. And one of them was to separate the, 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 the sacred from the secular. If you go back to Galileo, for example, you know, he, he had the radical idea that the earth was not at the center of the universe. And he said, you know, the planets all revolve around the sun. Now that conflicted at the time with official church doctrine and the church was politically ascendant and, uh, and they threatened him with torture if he didn't rescind that, that claim. Uh, whereas we go forward a couple of hundred years to, or 300 years perhaps to Darwin, and although his ideas of evolution and the ideas that human beings are descended from ape-like ancestors uh, were not popular with religious people at the time, the church was no longer in a position to censure him or, or to, to threaten him. And so we got to a point where uh, sacred knowledge or sacred ideas could no longer uh, prevent no knowledge from advancing or, or from people making claims about the natural world that the church found unpopular. Now, when we look at Māori traditional knowledge, I don't think that there is a, a, a separation of the, the sacred from the secular. And so at one time, I'll, I'll tell you a, a, a particular instance of something that happened that will give you a, an idea of what I mean. There was a, a standard, an assessment unit for NCEA in microbiology, and it was about microorganisms. And part of it was knowledge about the use of microorganisms in food production. And there was a claim in this standard that if... Uh, one was to say karakia, that is Māori prayers, in the presence of beer brewing or, or uh, yogurt forming or whatever, this would enhance the, the process of fermentation in the science standard. Now, I, I started to write about this and it, it quickly disappeared. And, and it, it has been the case that the ministry has pulled back from a lot of its more extreme positions uh, when people start to draw attention to them. But the fact that they would ever think that that was a reasonable thing to put into a science standard tells you where they're at. And what we're talking about when we're talking about the fusion of Mataranga Māori into disciplines like science, it creates confusion. And I would also say that it brings... Mataranga Māori into disrepute and I don't want to see that because I actually believe that mythological understandings of the world are important I don't think they're just stories right? I think stories are not just stories I, I mean I, I'm, I'm quite the fan of Jordan Peterson and, and uh, I know he's talked a lot about this that, that actually the, the narratives of our cultures are incredibly important to our psychological well-being. And so I don't want anything I'm saying here to be taken as disrespect for Maharanga Māori. I just don't think that it belongs in a science curriculum. Yeah. And it belongs in its own curriculum area. Well, just Sorry, and, just on myth, how I frame it, I always say, that, say there's a lot of truth in fiction. Absolutely right. You know, I... I I talked about my 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 nine year old daughter and and she loves stories right uh, and the way she the way they kind of light up her being is is incredible and we talk you know about the concept of strong stories and what what we mean by that are ones that really you know get into the basis of what it is to be human we can we can think about 
you know, stories like The Lord of the Rings, which she, she loves, which is a, a story about uh, loyalty and trust and friendship and, and also overcoming great obstacles and, and great challenges and evil. And, um, and I think that when we fill ourselves with stories like that, they, they do actually do something for us in terms of giving us resolve in the world and, and making us better people. But we mustn't confuse them with science, with, with understanding of the natural world. Because, I mean, I, I, a number of times people have said to me, science is just another story. Yeah, well, that's wrong. Yeah, I, I was <laughs> going to say that. So science is not just another story. Now, why, is, why isn't science just another story? Well, first of all, it's not a story in the same way that the biblical stories or the Lord of the Rings are, are stories. They, they, they don't necessarily affir, affirm our being in the same way. And so I would say, you know, the narrative stories, the stories of, as it were, fiction or mythology uh, have a power that scientific stories don't always have. But what science does have on its side is evidence, right? So you've got to test your claims against evidence uh, and so they tell us how things are. The stories of science tell us literally how the world is or the best approximation to how it is that we can manage at the time. And of course, in science, we always want to improve that story and test it more and more with evidence and change the theories and maybe occasionally throw out whole paradigms and bring in new ones. That's Kuhn's idea. Uh, so scientific stories are co uh, a subject of constant revision in the face of new evidence. Their role is to tell us how the natural world is. Uh, yeah, it's, a, it's a process of getting as close to the truth as we possibly can. Uh, and that, and that's that is, right. That is a, it's, a infinite, it's literally an infinite game. It'll go on forever. And let, let's, let's take, a, let's take a, an opposite example to illustrate the difference between the, the truth of a, a kind of mythological or quasi-mythological story and the truth of scientific story. So we want to fly from you know, New Zealand to England. We probably want to build an aeroplane. Now, the, the the real veracity of the scientific method or the or the power of the scientific method is demonstrated by the fact that we've been able to do that, that we can put together tons of metal into a shape that will take off from the ground and stay in the air for 20-odd hours as it traverses the globe. Now, we could also think of the wonderful story of Harry Potter, right? And it is a beautiful story. It's a brilliant mythologically based story. And we can think about the archetypes in Harry Potter. Um, but we can't get on a broomstick and fly to London. Yeah, basically, science works. And, yeah. and no, science gives us technology that works, I would yeah, say. And no, man, no amount of storytelling will, will conjure up a fantasy into real life. It won't, it won't conjure up machines that can fly around the world or fly to the moon or, or probe out of space. It won't give us uh, cures for the, to diseases and, and um, cancer and it won't give us the technology of the internet and so on. Yeah. I mean, basically, we're a scientifically based civilization. Yeah. I mean, but, but to come back to your point about rationality earlier on and, you know, science is based on rationality and we must preserve and cultivate it. But we mustn't either be seduced by the idea that it's all there is to life and that nothing else matters. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, well, actually, I, I'm actually just going to push back on that in a way because um, science, in a sense, the, the the beginnings of science or any beginning of a scientific idea is a almost an emotional, uh, it comes from the, an emotional um, wellspring. Um, Richard Feynman says first we guess and then we test Richard Feynman being one of the greatest physicists of the 20th century I, I agree and, with and him and so um, and when I was talking to Lawrence Krauss I, I sort of referenced um, I sort of disparaging referenced something um, and called it you know it comes from the school of making things up and he said no 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 you know I make things up every day but probably 99% of them are wrong but it's through the That's scientific right. method that um, we can determine that. So, so I, what I'm yep. as because I'm a I'm a creative, you know, I'm a musician, and etc. Um, and I'm always interested in that interface of create of how creativity interfaces with science. 
Um, and so in a sense from the, the bedrock of science is that ins- inspiration, but then it going, referring to, to the word you've used a lot, a discipline, the discipline of science can verify that. That's now, right. Now, getting getting back to what we're talking about, the interface between Mataranga Māori and the curriculum, um, I mean, something that I've investigated in um, a number of my podcasts, and just if, if this is the first time anyone's listening to my channel, I've done a whole series on what is science and the the relationship between Mataranga Māori and science, and I've spoken to some of the, the world's greatest thinkers on um, in science and also in Mataranga Māori, so that's worth having listened to. But yeah. um, you know, the 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 one that I've sort of focused on is this concept of Modi, M A U R I, and apologies if I've pronounced it incorrectly, um, which is a vitalistic uh, concept about. Um, it's basically saying that in every uh, piece of matter on the earth. And in the universe, there is a life force. Now, um, the last time I looked, you, you correct me if I'm wrong, that's in the still in the chemistry and biology curriculum. And it, um, just from memory, paraphrasing, for example, the, the students will be asked to um, investigate the modi of a river or the modi of the taiao. The taiao is the Māori... The environment. The environment. Yeah, well, the Māori word for the environment. Now, um, as a friend to, friend of mine said to me when we were discussing this, he said some smart 15-year-old is going to get up there in the science classroom and say to the teacher, essentially, what the hell are we discussing a, a vitalistic, non-scientific concept in a science classroom. Can you comment on that? Yeah. Well, I, I mean, the, the question that would come to my mind if I was that 15-year-old would be what, what you mean by life force. I mean, we could potentially define it in a way that uh, was tractable in a scientific manner if, if we reinterpreted, and it would be a reinterpretation from the Māori sense of the word, to mean the extent to which the river was able to sustain life. But that's that's actually so, not, with, that again, that's a reinterpretation. I mean, yeah. It is a reinterpretation, so, so I agree. Science, science so, in the science classroom is, uh, the things we're teaching kids are well-established scientific. Yeah, so I'm thinking here from the te- the perspective of the poor teacher and how they mm, might respond mm. to this this question, and, and that might be along the lines of what they, they might have to say, but... But the, the problem, the fundamental problem is that it's not defined as a scientific term. Yeah. What does it mean? What? How would we measure it? That's a really important question. If you're going to include something in the scientific theory, what what is the scale on which we're going to measure this thing? Once you've got the scale, if you're able to measure it with some validity and reliability, then you can adopt the term to refer to that scale if you want. I mean, who cares what we label the thing as, right? As long as it's well defined use whatever word you like. I, if I was, however, a um, a Māori person with a, a strong sense of the importance of mataranga Māori, I might find that a bit insulting because they've taken a word from my language that means something sacred to me and applied it in a place where it doesn't fit. Now, that might be the kind of flip side of the sense of outrage that scientific thinkers feel when they see the word inappropriately imported into science, right? So this is why I believe that we shouldn't be heading down this highly divisive and and silly path of trying to infuse a a mystical tradition or a, a tradition that has strongly mystical elements into a materialistic worldview like science. Yeah. Uh, the way I have look well, the way I view it is to me it's window dressing, and I would agree with you if, if I if I hope you're right. I hope it's that I hope it's just window dressing. But, I, I, but, I think it could do quite a lot of harm. Yeah, no, I, no, I, I, no, I agree. I, I, I think it will, will do a lot of harm. But to me, if if I was Maori and Mataranga Maori was you know the, the the core of my being, 
I would view what the um, Ministry of Education has done as window dressing. It's it's very shallow and um, yes, it's not actually paying respect to that tradition. Uh, what I would I, I, what I would suggest it, well simultaneously doing great violence to science. Y- yes, exactly. But I'm talking about from a from a Matananga yeah. Māori perspective. I agree so, with you. And what I and I think you would agree. I think if I remember correctly. I, if it was me, if I was God, I would say, let's have science and let's have a full-on, hardcore, mataranga Māori subject. And and yeah. if you want to do it, knock yourself out. Um, but I agree. mixing, you know, you see, essentially mixing them is uh, it's like mix, trying to mix oil and water. It doesn't work. Correct. Couldn't agree more. Okay. Well, um we should we should close, but so is is your you sent me a draft version of your of the Save Our Schools report. Is it finished? Is it published now? Yes, it is. So so it's available on the New Zealand Initiative website. So uh, perhaps you could post a link, and people who are interested could go and see it. It's called Save Our Schools, and it is a fairly wide ranging analysis of the problems in New Zealand's school system and uh, a whole lot of recommendations to improve things yeah well i would definitely put a link in there um just one final question is this report will it fall on deaf ears to the current labor government or do you think they'd be open to it and and the reverse of that is this report um being considered by the national party well I make it available to all politicians. I mean, it's available to everybody, but I certainly draw attention to its recommendations, uh, draw attention to its recommendations to to politicians from both sides of politics. I have to say at this stage, it's the National Party policy that reflects the recommendations a lot more. They they announced a a policy uh, at fairly much the same time and I was starting to publicise the report to improve the way literacy and numeracy are taught along the lines of what I recommend, which is a structured approach, which is what scientific evidence tells us works. Uh, So I'm more hopeful that if Erica Stanford becomes the Minister of Education, that the report would be uh, taken seriously. But there's no reason why Jan Tonetti should not do the same. It's, it's there for her to, to read and, and hopefully, you know, think about. I, I, you know, I really want to take a, a sort of humble epistemic stance here. I, I don't know everything. I don't think that everything that I've written in that cor- report is, you know, in some sense true and correct. It's the best I can do with my thinking based on the evidence that I, I have seen. And that includes scientific evidence. It includes evidence of data out of the school system itself and what I can see happening in teacher training, which I've got some experience with having been in an education faculty. So uh, it's the best I can do, but other people will have different ideas and I want to see a robust debate. I don't want anything to be adopted, including my ideas, uncritically. Yeah. I can't help myself. I have to ask one more question. In New Zealand... um I don't know when it was, 20, 25 years ago, maybe even 30 years ago, we set up the Reserve Bank um, um, to have monetary policy independent of politics. Um, And my way of thinking, it seems like quite a good idea. What I'm seeing in this this discussion about education is, is education seems to be a bit of a political football. Why... Why don't we have an equivalent of the Reserve Bank, so the Reserve Bank for, uh, of Education, where it's really educators and academics, um, scientists like, like yourself, um, work out what the best system is, rather than it being this political football when one party gets in, they change things, when another party gets in, they change things. Yes. Not a bad idea. I mean, how we'd set it up would be a contested thing in itself. Once you're in a highly politicised space, it's quite hard to to do. I, I think 
really probably the culture of our school education and our education academy is now pretty tilted in one political direction. Which, um, sorry, which, which is, so, what, what direction is that? Well, it goes back to the, the, the sociocultural issues I was talking about before. So I think it's pretty infused with heavily relativist ideas and the idea that all human relationships are predicated on power and and identity politics and, and these kinds yeah. of things have got their hooks in very and, deeply. And also that all knowledge is equal. Now, all knowledge has has equal status and, epistemically. And there's, and there's no such thing as the truth. Yeah, that's right. Now, you know, we, we should add a rider to that because while I believe there is such a thing as, a tr- as the truth, I don't, I don't believe that human beings have unfettered access to it, which is why science never says that it's discovered the truth. It's what it's discovered is the, or what scientists have come up with is the, the theory that explains the available evidence the best at the time and subject to revision. So while I think that there is a way that things are, we don't have particularly sound knowledge of the way things are. We, we can approximate it hopefully better and better over time. Uh, and that is, to me, epistemic humility. Well, I think that's a that's a good place to leave it. We'll we'll both leave it in a, a very humble state. Um, there's a lot to know, and we as humans can only know a very small part of it. Indeed. Well, thank you very much for coming on the podcast, Michael. That's my pleasure, Michael. You know, thank you for having me. It's been really great. Great, thank you. <laughs>